Welcome back to this tutorial series on how to implement a basic quest in Divinity Original Sin 2. So in our last video we had introduced encounters and in this video we're just going to modify the quest a little bit to insert uh, some dialogue and additional mechanics before the encounter. We want to spice it up. Uh, if you remember in the last tutorial what would happen is if the player came over and picked up the generator in this building then the NPCs over here would automatically aggro. So what we're going to do in this tutorial is uh, when the player picks up the generator, a dialogue will start that will warn the player that they have exactly five seconds to put that generator down. And if not, then we'll get the NPCs to aggro. This will introduce a couple more concepts into our story scripting. That will be useful for uh, any project really. Some common functions that will probably be used in anybody's campaign. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to open up the dialogue editor and we're going to create this very short dialogue that will fire when the player picks up the generator. So we'll just do new dialogue and actually the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to edit the speakers. I'm going to add one and we're going to have this dialogue take place between the chief engineer and the player. So if the player picks up the generator, the chief engineer is going to uh, initiate a conversation. So if we do engineer, we'll find it right here. We'll add that. That's speaker number one. And the next one will be group players. And all we're really going to need for this is a greeting. In here, you can see it's our chief engineer is the one that's going to be speaking. This is going to be an end node because it's just going to be one simple line of text. And we click on this. We'll add our line of dialogue. And we'll say something like, hey, just what do you think you're doing? You have exactly five seconds to put that down. And yeah, we've created the end node, so we should just be able to save this. And for a name, um, my naming conventions, whenever I have something that isn't necessarily tied to a particular uh, NPC or something, I'm just going to start it with something like EVT to stand for an event. And this is going to fire um, when the generator is picked up, so we'll call it event generator pickup. You can call it whatever you want. And while I'm here, I'm actually going to just control C that because I'm going to use it again later. So that's all saved. We didn't get any warnings about an improper dialogue, so that's good. It means we have what we need there. And we'll close that and then bring up the story editor. Now our code was over here under our start level. And a good place to put this would be under the LDC generator goal. We'll open this up. You can see this is where we created our uh, encounter scripting. If the character picked up the generator, we were looking for this item added to character, LDC generator, and if that happened, we would use this procedure character set temporary hostile relation. So now we want to change this. If the generator is added to the character, we are going to start that dialogue we just created. So what I'm going to do, this line is useful. We don't necessarily want to get rid of this right now. We'll keep it around, but we're just going to comment it out. So I'll just put two lines in there and that won't be used. And instead we want to start a dialogue. Now, there are a few different ways we could do this. I'm going to use, um, what you could do is you could just start typing in dialogue. If you want to see all the different functions that are available, then do the control space. So long as you've generated definitions, it will give you some uh, possible completions. Now, if we look at this, there are a lot of dialogue options. So you'd be scrolling through quite a few to try to find the one that you want. So. Let's um, escape out of that and let's say we wanted to look for something like start dialogue. If we com uh, complete that, 
you'll see that there is a select and start dialog. This is kind of a bare bones um, call into Osiris. But something else Larian has is a wrapper here called proc start dialog. And this is useful. So we're going to use that. And if we look up here, it gives us some information on the different arguments that it is expecting. But since there aren't any variable names in the declaration, it's kind of hard to understand exactly what it's looking for. So in order to get a little bit more clue as to what it's expecting here, we're going to control C this. Then we're going to come over into the top level and do a control shift F. And this allows us to search all of the goals in this story and look for proc start dialog. Now when we hit that, we're going to get a number of hits. So if you look at all of the hits, you'll find that it's used in their uh, general shovel scripts. And you'll see that there's a goal called global dialogues. And you can see that this is where it's actually defined because you can see the uh, definitions of what it expects. And there are, are a few different versions of it, right? They actually have a version where there's just a single speaker. They have another version where there are two speakers another where there are three. Uh, this is kind of called overloading a procedure, so you can define it multiple times. And then you can call whatever version suits your particular circumstances. So in our case, what we have is the chief engineer starting a dialogue with the player. So we're going to have two speakers. So we're basically going to use this version here. So when we call our proc start dialog, the first value that we want to give it is whether or not it's automated. And uh, ours is not because we want the player to be involved and to interact and to select when the conversation ends. So we're going to set that to zero. Then for the dialog, we're just going to give it the file name of the dialog that we just created. So that EVT generator pickup. For the first speaker, we're going to put the GUID of the chief engineer. And for the second speaker, we are going to put the GUID of the player. And we get that from the event that fired. So uh, we can come back over here to our LDC generator, proc start dialog. And we looked at that integer value. We saw that that was about automated. So we're going to say zero on that. And for the string, that's going to be the name of the dialog that we created, right? So let's do this. I'm going to do a save as just so I can copy and paste this. Um, I just saw someone in Discord the other day who was debugging a problem for, uh, I think they claimed four or five hours, and it happened to be a typo with either a dialog name or a variable name. So this is why it's really good to try and control paste, uh, cut and paste whenever you can to avoid any kind of errors. If I were to type that out, maybe I'd forget a letter or if it's case sensitive, I could end up messing that up and I wouldn't find it. So let's just be safe. We're gonna cut and paste the value or copy and paste the value. And now we want speaker one and speaker two. So as we said, the first speaker is going to be the chief engineer. So let's just type, start typing in engineer, control space. And because we've generated definitions before, we can find the GUID of the chief engineer. So we're going to do that. And then we need the GUID of the player, which we get from the event itself that fires. Um, when you add an item to a character, you get this event item added to character. And this is the item that was added. And Osiris is actually passing back to you what the GUID of the character is in this variable. And again, we can call this anything. And I actually prefer to call this something like player. In this case. Um, and we will use that here. We'll save. We don't need that anymore. We will, just to be safe, we're going to generate definitions, build, and reload, because it's been a while since 
we've done these tutorials and there have been a few patches. It's always good when you get a new patch to generate definitions before you go to build your story because there might be some slight changes. All right, we'll close that. And then we'll come over here and we'll run. I like to do things um, in small steps and then test them before going and adding a whole bunch of stuff. So we're going to be adding more logic to this eventually, but let's just make sure that our conversation fires before we go making it any more complicated. So I'm going to come over here, I'm going to move that barrel, grab the key, open the door, come in here, and I'll pick up the generator, and here we go. Now something that uh, you might notice here is it says new human female player. Uh, this means that we forgot to set the display name of this character earlier when we put this NPC down. So we'll want to go and change that. That doesn't look very good. The chief engineer is in the uh, GUID name, but it's not in the actual display name. So you can see that that seems to be working okay. So what we'll do is we'll go and change this before we forget. So the name that the game knows about is LDC Chief Engineer, but the display name we never changed. So we can just put that here. And if we save, and if we play, we put our mouse over, you'll see that she says Chief Engineer now. And in fact, we should be able to just drop this item. It doesn't have an icon, but, and if we pick it back up, now it says Chief Engineer. Okay, so now that we have the conversation working, let's go back to our story editor and let's modify the script even further so that it's not just an empty threat, but that we back up what the dialogue says. Now there's always more than one way to approach something. Um, I think a reasonable approach here is once the dialogue ends is when we're going to want to start our five second countdown. Uh, it wouldn't be very fair if you started the countdown while the player is trying to read. You kind of want to give them the chance to hit the end, have the dialogue finish, and then start the five second countdown from there. And if the player does not drop the generator within that time, then we can go ahead and do our uh, temporary hostile reaction and start the fight. So, a uh, very easy way to catch when a dialogue ends is used to is use an event called dialogue ended. I'll just start typing and be able to complete it here. And if we go up to our hints up here, you'll see that the first thing that it wants is a dialogue name. And we already know what that is. It's this one. So this event will fire any time this dialogue ends. Now the next thing it's looking for is what's called an instance ID. This is not something we know ahead of time. It's something that the game is going to pass to us. So we're just going to use a variable called underbar ID. You can call it whatever you want. You just have to make sure you're consistent, whatever you use for variable names. And it's basically what it says. It's so that you can detect the specific instance of a dialogue occurring. This can be helpful if you have a dialogue that is used in uh, multiple NPCs, maybe they use the same default dialogue and you want to catch the particular instance of it happening. Um, but the most important thing is it's it's used so that you can get a handle back to whatever the original speakers were that were involved in the dialogue. Um, it will become more clear in our next line, but basically this is a unique identifier that gives you a handle to the specific dialogue that just ended, the specific occurrence of it. So we want to catch when the dialogue ends. And the other thing that we're going to need to know is we're going to have to get the GUID of the player that was involved in the conversation because we're going to want to start a timer associated with that player. So there is a uh, query that's available called dialog get involved and we'll just start typing this out 
You can see that for any dialogue you can find out who the NPCs were that were involved in the dialogue or you could find out which player was involved in the dialogue. So we're going to use get involved player and when we call this query it's going to ask us for an instance ID. That's why this is important to us now. So when the conversation ends, Osiris is going to know, want to know, well, which occasion or which occurrence of this dialogue are you asking me about? And so we're going to use the ID that was passed in, that just ended. And then it's going to ask us for an index. Now this is useful in case there are um, multiple speakers involved, I believe. So we're just, because it's just one player that's involved, we're going to use player one. So for instance, if you had three different players that were all involved in a complicated conversation, you could use this number to index uh, player one or player two or player three. But since we only have one player involved, we're going to use an index of one. And then you can see how there is a little tag that says out, which means whatever this player value is, is something that's being provided to us. When something says in, it means Osiris expects you to provide it input variables. So those are input variables. It expects you to give it the value. When it says out, it means Osiris is going to output the value to you. So in here, we're just going to put under bar player. So what we've basically said here is once the dialogue ends, give me the involved player for the same ID that just ended here, the index of the first player, and put the value of the player's GUID into this variable called player. Okay, so once we have that, this is where we're going to want to start our timer. So if you want to find the different timer procedures that are available or calls that are available, you could type in the word timer hit control space bar and see what's available. You can see there is something called timer launch here. If we were to do that, you would it works pretty simply. You would call timer launch, you would give it a string, so you would just give it a name, whatever you want, foo, and then you give it a time. And the time is in milliseconds, so if you wanted five seconds, you would put 5,000 milliseconds, okay? Now, <coughs> You can think of these timer names as almost like global variables. So there's a little bit of a better option for us here. Let's go back and look what's available. Lorraine has these little wrappers called proc object timer. And we're going to use this one. So this is basically defining a procedure where the timer is associated with a particular object. Okay, so it's not really global the timer is associated with a specific object. This way, it's just a little easier to manage and keep track of, plus you can have timers that have the same name, but are associated with multiple objects, and that can be helpful. So in this case, we're going to do proc object timer, and the object that we're going, asso going to associate it with is the player that picked up the generator. So this makes sense, right? We want when a player picks up the generator and uh, a dialogue starts we get a handle to the player that was involved in that dialogue and then we create a timer that's going to be attached to that same player that was participating in the dialogue we're going to give the timer a name uh, let's just call it something like LCD uh, generator countdown and again, for the number of seconds, it's going to be 5,000 milliseconds. And this is going to create a timer on the player that is going to call a procedure when the timer elapses. Okay. Um, and the way these proc object timer works is once the timer expires, it's going to call a procedure and you, you want to use proc object timer again. 
Let's just type in timer. Proc object timer finished. It's going to call this procedure. And in here, we're going to put a variable for whatever object it is at finish. The first argument is basically going to pass into you whatever object was associated with the timer that finished. So that's going to be the player, right? Because that's what we associated with in the first place. So that's what we expect to come in. And for the string, we're just, oops, and we had a typo over here. We forgot to close our quotes. So we want to use the same name. Okay. So once we start this timer, when it when five seconds go by, it's going to call this proc object timer finished. It's going to pass us in the GUID of whatever the object was that the timer was associated with. In this case, we know it's going to be the player, so that's why we called the variable name player. But again, you could call it whatever you want. And we had to give it the same uh, description string or event string that we passed in. So what we want to do is once this timer finishes counting down, once the five seconds are up, we want to see whether or not that generator is in the player's inventory. And if it is, then that's what we're going to create our hostile relation between the player and the chief engineer. So what we'll do is we'll add an and statement here. So if the timer finishes, and we want to see if that item is in the player's inventory. So we can use the call uh, item is in, um, we can call character inventory. And the item that we're curious about is the generator. So we'll start typing in generator, control space bar. And we have two matches here. One of them was for the door. We don't want to check to see if the door is in the player's inventory, but we want the generator. So that's our first value. The next item that expects is the character, GUID. So we want to see if it matches the player, the same player that the timer expired on. And then the next is a Boolean, and this is an out. So we want to check to make sure that this is true. So we're going to put a 1 here. Okay. If we were to put a 0, then what we would be asking is if the generator is not in the user's inventory. But we want to see if the item actually is in the inventory. I know it can be kind of confusing because the name says item is in character inventory, so you might just assume that this is checking only if it is in the inventory, but it's actually this Boolean value at the end that is determining whether or not you're checking to see if it is in the inventory or is not in the inventory in the inventory. When we set the boolean to 1, we are checking whether or not that item is in the user's inventory. So if it is, then what we're going to want to do, I think the first thing that we'll want, we're going to want to do is provide some visual feedback on what's happening. So how about we display a little text over the chief engineer that says something like, stop that thief. So we'll do a display text and give it an object. And in this case, we want the chief engineer. So if I type chief, control space bar, I can get the GUID. And then this is the text that's going to display. Stop that thief. And the next thing that we want to do is we want to create the hostile relationship. Now we already basically have that line. We know how it works. So we can take that now. We can move it down here and get rid of the comment. One thing we have to change is we used to use the variable under bar uh, char for the character, but we've gone to using this variable name player, so that has to be consistent. And we will do this. And if we've got everything right, then this should work. Once the dialog ends, we find who the player was, start a timer on that player for 5,000 milliseconds, once that timer finishes, it's going to call this procedure. The procedure will also check to see if the generator is in the player's inventory. And if it is, we'll display some text and we'll create that hostile relationship. So let's go ahead and 
build and reload and see if this works. And we have errors. And I think I know what this is going to be. Yes. Good. It's always good to have some errors so we can find out uh, what's going on. Okay. So you'll see there is a, um, a conflict with what the function expects in here. If you were to look at the function, it's expecting a character GUID in the second, um, for the second argument. And when this procedure gets called, this procedure is not specifying what kind, what type of variable this is. It could be anything that's in there. It could be an item GUID. It could be a string. It could be whatever. And since we haven't specifically told this procedure what's coming in, it means that this call is confused as to what value is in here. So we need to assure it that whatever is in here is a character GUID. So this is called casting. We're going to cast this to a character GUID so that we are basically telling the function, don't worry about it. We've checked it. We know that that's going to be a player GUID coming in here. And we'll probably have to do the same thing down here. So let's do that and let's try another build. All right, and now we're good. So let's go ahead and reload our level and story. And it doesn't reset all the state. Our player is still inside here, still has a generator, but let's drop that one. All right, so this is messed up. So a lot of times you have to really open the project from the beginning in order to completely reset the state. Reloading the story does not clear out inventory items that the player has. It doesn't reset their level or anything like that. It really just does reset the story state. So we're going to start from the beginning here. And we're going to... Having some mouse issues here. So we'll go inside. We'll grab the generator. We'll get our conversation. We'll end. And we'll go and we'll drop this. And we'll make sure that we don't get... And we'll wait a few seconds here and make sure that we don't get attacked. Should be clear by now. So let's try it again. If we pick this up, we should get the conversation again. And when the conversation ends, we're still going to get that eventifier that says dialogue ended, and it should restart the timer again. So we should get another fresh five seconds here. This time we're just going to wait it out and see if they're really serious. And there you can see that the fight has started. So, it seems to be working as intended. Okay, so we know this is working. Um, one thing we're going to want to do is we're just going to want to test a couple of other corner cases, try a few things, try to break it, because um, you really have to try to think of wacky things when you ever implement a quest, because <laughs> there's a lot of uh, open-ended play in Divinity Original Sin 2, right? Um, for instance, what happens if I just move, try to move this generator outside the door and pick it up way out here? Is the conversation still going to fire? Um, so that's kind of a fun thing to try, right? Um, I did notice a little bit of a bug earlier. That is kind of comical. So let's say we come in here and we want to try to move this. When we first uh, created this generator, it's a scaled down version of a bigger object. And if we go to try and move this right now, oops, didn't mean to do that. I'm going to drop this. Uh, I noticed that if you try to move it, <laughs> it, it moves according to its 
uh, original scale. So I don't think we can get that through the door if we want to, but we can try to do it in little steps, right? So yeah, I can't get it through. I can get it close. It's as close as we'll get. Now we can come out here and drop it. Phew, made it within the five seconds, and then we can keep moving this way over. Now, this might be perfectly acceptable for however um, you are creating your quest. Um, you might want to completely encourage players doing, you know, wacky things like this if they can get it to work. Now, in this case, that proc start dialog doesn't seem to care how far away you are. Um, it's just going to fire. Uh, one thing I've noticed, however, is if you're really far away, it's going to do that. You can see, stop that thief. So. Uh, the five seconds have elapsed. There's a temporary hostile relationship. However, we are far enough away that they aren't aggroing, right? And so then if I get closer, because it was only a temporary hostile reaction, I don't think they're going to react to a fight right now. So they kind of have amnesia. It was temporary and, you know, that all worked fine when we were close. But when we try to stretch the envelope of the mechanics there, we can kind of get away with some stuff. And that might be acceptable, uh, it might not. If it's not acceptable, then you'll have to try to find different ways to do that. Instead of setting a temporary hostile relation, you might want to actually just change the entire uh, faction of the chief engineer to an enemy so that they'll always be an enemy. Um, when the five seconds elapses, you might want to um, do something like cause the chief engineer and all the other players to, um, you know, run towards the NPC and attack them. Uh, so it all depends on what you want to do, but definitely try to think outside the box when you're testing things, because if you don't, your players are going to. Now, before we end this video, there's just uh, one more thing that I think I will go over. And that's just addressing the issue of well, how do I find these functions, right? It, it all looks pretty easy when you know what you're looking for, right? I already knew what uh, functions I wanted to call, so it makes it go a lot more straightforward when you just know exactly which functions you want to call. So how do you, how do you figure this stuff out on your own? Well, um, one of the first things that you can do uh, that I do quite a bit is if I know how something worked in the Origins campaign, then I will go and I'll check out their scripts. Um, I always create one project, a campaign that has a dependency on Origins, and I build the story, and then I can always just go and reference the story. Um, it can just be an empty campaign, but as long as you build the story once, if your campaign, it can be a standalone campaign, um, and then that way you don't have all the levels, you don't have all the overhead of trying to open up Origins itself. You can just create your own standalone campaign that has a dependency on Origins, build the story, and then you can go and check out all of their scripts and what they did to make things happen. Uh, something else that you can do is you can always open up the story header, and in here, after you've uh, generated definitions and built it, you will at least get a list of every uh, call, every event, every query that's in the game. And you can just start searching by words that make sense and try to find a call or a procedure that looks like it might be what you want. And then when you find something that you want, that's where you can go and search for any use of it in the game. So for instance, um, you know, we have this dialogue ended. If I did a control C and I went over here and a control F, uh, control shift F, and I looked for it, I could look at all the places um, where dialogue ended is called. Now, there aren't going to be a lot in this standalone campaign, 
again, this is why I suggested creating a campaign that has a dependency in Origins, because then you can go and you can do a Control Shift F in the story of that campaign that has a dependency in Origins, and you can see every place where Origins used that call. And then you can get a number of examples, and you might get a better idea if that's the function, if that's the query, if that's the event that makes sense for your purposes. Uh, the other thing that can be helpful is going to the wiki. So um, if you go to the docs.larian.game main page, and you go to the Divinity Engine, then you go to Technical Docs, and then under uh, Systems and Osiris Story Scripting. Here you'll have, they have the Osiris Overview, um, how it works, design patterns, gotchas, very useful stuff. If you have not read any, any of this yet, I highly recommend going back and taking a look at it, especially after you've done some story scripting now. Uh, you can see why things are done the way they are, and um, just learn a little bit as you can, as much as you can over time. Um, and if you go into Osiris API, they have this broken down by calls, events, queries, and shared mod helpers. So if you were to go into calls here, this isn't all of them, but they are uh, continually documenting, documenting some of these over time. So if you wanted to, uh, you know, find out how a uh, character use skill is used, they give you the prototype for the procedure, they'll give you some description, and then sometimes they'll have additional notes that are very helpful. So you want to check this out as well. Um, now that's basically how I go about it. I will start typing in um, if I need to do something. If I know I need a timer, like I said, I'll start typing in timer. I'll hit control shift or control space. I'll start looking at any names that look uh, close to something that I need. I'll look at the arguments. I'll look how it's used in origins. I'll try to go to the wiki to see if there's any information there and uh, some trial and error. Okay, I think that's where I'm going to end it for this tutorial. Uh, in the next one, I think um, I'm going to add a little bit of scripting to give our player um, maybe a default preset and some starting equipment just because we're going to be getting into an encounter there and uh, our test player is continuously running around naked here. So we can add some scripting so that when we are running in the editor mode he gets some preset equipment and it will introduce us to random numbers and how to do preset how to apply presets and then after that we'll try to wrap up the quest and then we'll go into some uh, just some additional polishing and uh, helpful items for rounding out uh, a quest hope it's been helpful as always go ahead and uh, add any questions you have in the comments for the video feel free to submit uh, any particular things that you would like to see done in a tutorial and I will do my best to get to them. Uh, thanks for your patience and all those who have been waiting for more videos. I've been working on uh, my personal project. I have a little bit of a team going there and I was really busy getting that up and running and then the holidays hit and uh, got sidelined a bit from the editor but we'll try to get back and try to get these videos being made on a more regular basis. Thanks and happy modding!